Hey there, welcome to another episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's episode you will see the interview that I did with Steve Heldstrup. I spoke with Steve about his trans classic Synesthesia which came out in 1999 under his alias The Thrill Seekers and of course I spoke with him as well about the upcoming Hydra album. Enjoy! Steve Heldstrip was born on October 24, 1973 in York in England. He already started his passion for music at a young age. At the end of the 1980s Steve was a member of an electronic band which was called A Wonderful Thing. When he was studying classical music and composition, Steve formed a pop group with his friend Kevin Dowell. The name of the group was The Flood, and in October 1995 they released the single Right Here, Right Now. While he had a job at computer games developer Manic Media, Steve started to produce trance music. In 1999 he finished a track which he called Synesthesia. It came out under the name The Trill Seekers via Neo Records in the UK, where it sold over 12,000 copies. Now, almost 20 years later, Synesthesia is still one of the most famous trans classics ever. During his career, Steve did work together with names such as Ferry Koste, Ali and Fila, Mike Push, Pulser, and many others. Besides his project, The Thrill Seekers, Steve released tracks under various other project names such as N Motion, In Sigma, Rapid Eye, and Hydra. And good news for all fans of Hydra, since in 2019, Steve is gonna release an album under that alias. So, because the 20th anniversary of Synesthesia is coming up, and because of the upcoming Hydra Artist album, I decided to sit down with Steve and do an interview with him. My first question to Steve was, what he did remember from the production process of Synesthesia. The production process, wow, it was, um, it was a journey. Um, I've been making trans music for quite some time for a games company and when I came up with the idea to make synesthesia it was possibly the first time I'd actually sat down and was like this is something you know I, I knew I had something which could be pretty special um, the melody itself came about in about three minutes um, once I, I, I we basically I think I'd been to um, to turn mills in London with a few friends and they all came back to my house afterwards and we were just like you know after party talking and synesthesia came up as a word and I was like, oh, what's that? That sounds interesting. And we got talking about how some people can experience sound as a smell or touch as a colour. And I thought that was a really interesting concept for a track. And the melody, you know, once my friends had gone home, I would straight to the studio and, well, studio, bedroom. And um, I wanted to make a track that was very, very simple. And I wanted to make it with just three notes. And the melody came almost within three minutes and the chord progression and it just stuck with me, so you know, I came back to it and for, like I said earlier, for the first time I felt like, yeah, this is really special, for me at least. Um, so the actual process of finishing the track was six months, just because I knew that if I just got it perfect and I worked on this some more and did the arrangement and all the parts that were going on. And normally, when I was making music back then, two weeks was pretty normal for me to start and finish a track six months but I yeah I'm glad that I took a long time to make it and it went through various versions so the first mix obviously the original mix um, which was what Neo signed was the first version if you like and then I wanted to make it better still and the, the, the version that I carried on working on became the On Motion remix um, because Neo wanted to release both versions so we put it out as a different remix yeah was there another track or maybe another artist that inspired you when you were working on the track? Absolutely, yeah, it was um, Chicane's Offshore, very clearly. Um, so before I wrote Synesthesia, I was working for a computer games company in, in a very nice studio. And, um, you know, every Friday we'd pop down to a local record store and I picked up Chicane's Offshore, bought the CD. In fact, I think I heard Pete Tong play it on Radio 1. I was like, I have to get that. So I bought the CD from the record store and I must listen to it like, I don't know, dozens of times just in complete awe how something so simple, which are two notes, two notes over and over, could generate so much emotional response for me, you know, I was like, that's what I want to do. And that was always in the back of my mind, I want to do something so simple, but it can also be a journey as well and be intricate and conjure up feelings. So that's, that was, yeah, for sure. What kind of equipment did you use for synesthesia? Um, the, the, the main synth was Roland JP8000. Um, so I was very lucky when I was working in the studio to have, in fact, interesting story was um, all my kids um, who made Spiritualized on Neo, um, Westy, who worked at a music store near to me, um, I went to the music store one day and he was like, oh, Steve, 
check out this JP8000. I was like, oh, yeah. this is wow, this is amazing. And I, I instantly recognised some of the sounds of, you know, as being, you know, trans sounds. I just wanted to have that sound. And he said, well, look, take it away. Um, and if you want to buy it, we'll work out a way for you to pay for it. So back then it was £600, which I didn't have. Um, but he said, look, bring me £60 every month or as much as you can. So that's what we did. And I'm so glad that happened because um, all those sounds inspired me so much. And that synth obviously inspired a whole generation of producers, I think. And trans was very much geared around that synth at, at that time. It still is very much. Um, it's inspired a lot of producers now. And the super source sound that we all know as being trans all came from that synth, mostly. Yeah. Trance was still a very new genre when you made the track. Was it difficult to get the track signed back then? Um, <laughs> it, it, I didn't know if anyone would like it. I liked it and that was the main thing for me. And my friends that I played it to, because we used to go clubbing and we'd listen to, you know, all genres from Hard House, we would go see Tall Paul or Satoshi Tomi, so Deep House to, you know, Hard House I used to listen to. And, um, my manager, who was, um, it was a man, he was more of a friend really, but he went on to become my manager. Um, because I'd met Westy and Andy Perring, who, were spirit, uh, who did Spiritualize and signed it to Neo, I said, why don't you take it to Neo, see if they might be interested in signing it. And at the same time, they took it to Positiva and all these other labels, and Neo snapped it up straight away. And um, I was like, oh wow, they want to sign it, great, oh, this is amazing. Could we get an advance for it? And it's like, yeah, yeah, they're going to give you a thousand pounds for this track but you have to sign the publishing as well and you have to give them two other tracks. I was like, right, okay, um, well, I've got this one and this one. And yeah, take the publishing, great. I get a thousand pounds, amazing. Um, so we signed the deal. About two weeks later, Positiva came back. We want to sign this track. They offered us 60 grand right there for one track without any publishing. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Oh, wow. Yeah, really, yeah, right. <laughs> and so the journey began. And um, so yeah, it got signed straight away, which was amazing for me back then. How did you come up with the project name, The Thrill Seekers? <laughs> so I'd been making music for a few years, well, pretty much all throughout my you know, childhood years. Um, and I had a sample from a sample CD, which basically went, here come The Thrill Seekers. And I used it in the track. And um, my friends just said, you should call yourself The Thrill Seekers. And I did. And it's kind of stuck with me ever since. So regarding the project name, it says The Thrill Seekers. But in fact, it is just you. How many people still think there's more than one person in the project <laughs> after all these years? Pretty much everyone I meet. <laughs> in fact, yeah, I was, um, I was inspired by Will Atkinson's t-shirt, I'm Will Atkinson's ghost producer. I'm gonna have a t-shirt made that says, I'm the Thrill Seeker. Has to be done, I think. <laughs> in the year 2000, a vocal version from the track came out. Synesthesia, Fly Away, with vocals written and performed by Cheryl Dean. Yep. Who came up with the idea for this version? Um, well, basically, um, when the record was signed to Neo, one of the owners of Neo was Eddie Gordon, and one of his jobs was to produce Pete Tong's Radio One show. And so he had access to a lot of DJs, and so he was able to give it to Paul Van Dyke and the Radio One DJs, for example. And they said, if you want to get this on daytime radio, it has to have a vocal. I was ob very objectionable to that. I was like, no, this is my baby. We ain't putting a vocal on it. Doesn't need anything. It's it's fine as it is. And they said, well, look. We've got a couple of guys that write in our studio in the Neo offices. Let them come up with something and if you like it, you know, we'll give it a try. I said, well, okay, we'll try it. And they came up with it. And in fact, I brought this as well. This is what they sent me. So this is what they brought me. Um, they sent me a DAT. So back in the olden days, um, we used to send DATs, digital audio tape. And that was what they sent me, this DAT. And so I put the vocal on. I made a brand new version of the track and that's what became the vocal version. The vocal version was also used in the Samuel L. Jackson movie, The 51st State. How did you make that happen? Um, they actually came to us. Um, again, it was one of those uh, wow moments in my career. I was like, what, it's going to be on a movie? And um, yeah, it just happened. Um, when it came out at the cinema, I took my mum to see it. And it was just like, it was the most amazing moment. And the movie was coming towards the end. And I was like, mum, everyone's gone, but we must stay. I want to see my name at the end of the film. And we were just sat there. And then my name came up, I was like, right, we can go. I'm happy now. <laughs> but yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was a very, very nice moment. What is your favourite memory when it comes to synesthesia? Uh, um, it, it's a bittersweet story for me because of, you know, the, the journey that it took through record labels and, you know, kind of, um, you know, record labels not being entirely honest, shall we say, with, you know, giving me the royalties that I should have got. So, you know, it's, um, I've got a lot of bittersweet feelings about it, but. 
I think the, the one thing I'll be eternally grateful for was um, uh, Eddie Gordon giving the record to Paul Van Dijk who signed it to Bandit for Germany. And um, Paul then was having a party um, on a boat and he asked my manager at the time, um, can Steve come along and perform the track on stage, you know, it'd be great promotion and you know, we'll get to meet each other. And yeah, great, I can go and I can play the music and that was all going to be fine. And then two weeks before um, this was going to happen, his manager got in touch to say, look, we, um, there's not going to be room on the stage for Steve to bring his keyboards and do the performance. It'd be a lot easier if he could DJ, could, can Steve DJ? My manager not wanting to, you know, turn down an opportunity was like, yeah, of course I can DJ. Yeah, 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 no problem. Steve will come and DJ. So when he, when he phoned me to say, Steve, you need to DJ, and I'm like, what, like with vinyls and mixing? And it was like, yeah, yeah, you need to, you want me to mix at Paul's party? And I'm like, I was already trembling with nerves at the prospects of meeting Paul Van Dyke, let alone playing at his party. And now I'm going to DJ at his party and I can't DJ, I've never DJed in my life before. So a friend of mine, Tim Stark, was working for Mato Distribution. He was like, look, Steve, we've got two weeks. We're gonna, I'm gonna bring a whole bunch of records to your house. Um, we went out and bought some 1210s, set them up in my kitchen, and literally for like 14 hours a day, I, I practiced with the same 10 records over and over, and I memorized where I should move the pitch control, and I played them backwards and forwards, and I just went over, to the point where I was reasonably confident that if I'm having a good day, I might just get through the set without messing up too much. Um, so we get on the plane, and we arrive at the airport, and they sent Pete from Blank and Jones to um, meet us at the airport to take us to the hotel. Um, and then when Pete met us at the airport, he was like, um, oh, Paul's actually recording his radio show um, for next week right now, and he'd love you to go along to the radio station. I was like, oh, wow, amazing. So I was getting a bit nervous again at the prospect of meeting Paul, who was my idol at the time. And then when I get to the radio station, he's like, do you know what? Let's play back to back. Let, I've got two hours. Let's play back to back for two hours. And I, I was like, I almost died. I, I must have, you know, I just wanted to disappear. So I had to confess to Paul Van Dijk that I can't really DJ. I haven't DJ before. I've, I've had two weeks to learn this set. And I hope tonight at the gig I'll be okay. But there's no way I can do back to back with you. And he was like, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. So he puts on the first record and the second record. And with, um, with maybe like, what, like 20 or 30 seconds of the record running out, he puts the next record on, he gets the pitch just absolutely perfect and it's the most amazing mix. I'm just sat there in total awe, shaking, and it's like, right, okay, your turn. So I, I literally couldn't hold the needle. I was shaking like this and I put it onto the vinyl and I remember it just skated across the vinyl and I was like, oh. and the guy who was producing the radio show was looking at me as if to say, yeah, you're right. I'm like, not really, you know. Um, luckily, it wasn't being filmed at the time. It was just being recorded. But anyway, so I tried to mix in the, my first record. I can't remember what it was, but it was one of the records I was going to play that night at the party. And it was a complete train wreck. And it was like, okay, just, just keep going. We'll, we'll fix it later. Paul did another mix. I came to my second mix. And again, it was another train wreck. So it was uh, a horrendous baptism of fire. Here I was playing back to back with Paul Van Dyke. Luckily, it wasn't live on radio. It was being recorded for the following week. So we said, look, let's, let's stop that. We'll use the last hour for Paul to um, record a one hour um, show. And when you get back to the UK, we, we need you to record a one hour, record it to a DAT tape and send it to us for next day delivery. And that's what we'll do. And that's what happened. So meanwhile, uh, Paul's like, are you really going to be OK to DJ tonight at this party? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I really didn't know. Um, so we get to the boat. And the boat set sail, I think it's the River Rhine, I think. And the, the, the decks were hanging from chains because obviously the boat sways around. And so that threw in another kind of obstacle. So not only can I not really DJ in front of a crowd, the, the decks were swinging about. But from what I remember, I think I only messed up a few times. So, so that was the first time I'd ever DJed in my life. <laughs> so I'll be eternally grateful for the track, for opening those doors. And of course, DJing's got a lot easier since. <laughs> now that is a good story. So next year it is 20 years ago since Synesthesia came out. Are you planning something special because of its anniversary? Um, I haven't actually planned anything, but I think we should do something, whether it's, I don't know. I mean, for me, people say you're going to do another remix or update it. I, I don't feel as though I can really add any more to that track now, because I did the original version, then the Unmotion version. 
and then when I was doing my live performances with Live Extreme, I made another version. And even when I made the Live Extreme version for playing live, I didn't feel as I was really adding to it. I was just changing stuff for the sake of it. So, um, you know, some tracks are best left alone, and that's how I feel about it, to be honest. If somebody else wants to do a mixed package, then, you know, it's with Amada now, so perhaps they can, you know, organise something. But for me, I think I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Another project name from you is Hydra. Yeah. You're in the middle of working on an album for your Hydra alias. What can we expect on this album? Um, the, the whole thing about Hydra was um, when I wanted to bring the name back and I made Amber, I wanted to, you know, have the feeling from Affinity, which was the first Hydra release. And you know, keep, keep the loveliness and, and the plucks and the warmth, but make the tracks more of a journey. Because what I really miss about trance music from when I first got into trance was that it was a journey. You know, Offshore, for example, you know, it's a 10 minute track. You have a beautiful strings, you have a break beat, you have you know, the pianos and a double breakdown. And it's a journey, you know, whereas trance these days tends to be, you know, five, six minutes in and out, same structure, intro, breakdown, the drop, and then, it, you know, the track finishes. Hydra, the whole thing about Hydra is to go back to what I loved about trance. So, you know, there may be three or four sections within a track, not just one or two ideas, but maybe 10 that all kind of develop and evolve. Um, so when I made Amber, we had the, you know, the beautiful breakdown and people expect the drop to have the melody carry on, but it didn't, it went somewhere different and then the melody came and, you know, so it's about just mixing things up. Um, I don't like where trance has gone in the sense that everyone's using the same sounds and the same templates and it's going back to being different and so I'm trying not to take influence too much from what's going on now so that I can not be influenced by what other people are doing because it's the opposite of that basically is what I'm trying to do. Yeah. How is the production of the album going so far? Is it almost finished? Um, I've, got, um, I've got like five tracks finished. I've got maybe another five tracks which are in various states of being finished. Um, I don't want to have any more than 10 tracks because you know a couple of the tracks are 10, 11 minutes anyway. Um, so there will be you know 80 minutes of music on the album regardless whether it's you know um, if it's eight, 10 minute tracks that's what it'll be in the end. Um, so for me I feel like I need to do four really really solid tracks which I've got the startings of. So in, yeah we're more than halfway and tracks to finish off so that's where we're at at the moment. And any collapse or is it 100% you? So me at the moment yeah. Do you have a title for the album already? I do, but I'm not going to tell you just yet. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> when can we expect the album in stores? Um, I'm hoping, I mean, my absolute deadline is um, end of this year to be, and then you have a, like maybe a month to six weeks of getting the physical, you know, the vinyl and the CDs pressed. So hopefully in people's hands no later than February is my goal. You work together with Amplified Music for the Hydra album. Is there something more you can tell us about this? Yeah, um, you know, Dan Willis, who started Amplified, came up to me, um, we were in LA for Dreamstate a couple of years ago, and he was saying that, you know, I want to try and something new where artists can connect with their fans in different ways. So, you know, you can offer them days in the studio. And it's a way for, you know, fans to get more than just a CD or an MP3 download. Um, so they can, you know, experience different parts of it. So, for example, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is I have a private Facebook group where music producers are interested in how I get the sound that I do, um, have put um, some money into the pot and they will get the CD, they'll get the MP3s, they'll get a thank you in the notes and they can also have one-to-one -one contact with me throughout the rest of the production um, and while I'm doing live streams. So, and it's, it's a way to, to fundraise the money needed to, you know, pay for everything that's involved from the manufacturing and everything else that goes with releasing an album. So rather than going the traditional record label route, we thought we'd do this crowdfunding thing and see where it goes. And so far, it's going really well. Great, that's pretty cool. So I guess we can expect a Hydra album tour as well next year? Yes, um, that'll be certainly in the works. So um, yeah, I don't want to go too into that at the moment. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll get it finished and then un unleash, unleash it. <laughs> There have been some other project names you worked on as well, for example Rapid Eye with Tim Stark and In Sigma with Andy Pairing aka Pulsar. Are there any plans to release something under these names in the future? Um, no plans at the moment. I spoke to Andy um, to say look, you know, in fact I tried to get Andy to come and play with me last year when I was doing 15 years of trance tour um, to come along and just do an In Sigma set and he said look, you know, I, I'd love to but he, he was at a stage in his life where he's done with music and he wanted to you know you know 
just not be involved in music anymore and that's fine so sadly I don't think In Sigma is going to happen. Tim I don't think he's really interested in doing <laughs> another collab so yeah I think it's just Hydra for now. What do you consider to be your very best production or remix ever? Oh wow. Um, um, it's bit, uh, I think if, if it's my own music I think Amber is kind of 50-50 with synesthesia now in terms of how I felt about it, you know, and how, you know, for me it was quite an accomplished piece. It had everything I loved about trance and said all those things that I wanted it to say. So that was good. Song for Sendai as well was another one which, um, you know, that song was kind of influenced by what happened in um, Sendai when, you know, the tsunami hit and I saw all these images on, on, on the news and it just really struck something with me. So I sat down to write a piece of music about it and the way that the track unfolded almost tells the story of the waves coming in and causing all the chaos that it did but at the end of it there was hope and we're going to survive and rebuild and that you know a lot of people come to me and say they can hear, they can see the story in the music and that's what I try to do so for people to say they can follow the journey of the waves and the destruction and the hope at the end um, to get that feedback was well, I, I did what I set out to do so that was good as well but yeah those three I think. <laughs> so the Hydra album will be released next year what else can we expect from you in the near future? Oh. <laughs> Can we just get the Hydra done? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I'm so meticulous with my production, so when I'm in the studio, you know, a, a lot of people release a lot of tracks, maybe 10, 15, 20 tracks in a year. I don't like to, I'd rather release three or four tracks that I'm absolutely personally happy with, rather than just putting tracks out for the sake of it. So for every track that I release, there's maybe 12 that I've just put in the bin, you know, because I don't see the point in releasing tracks that, you know, don't have a, a, a need to be released, I guess. Quality over quantity. Exactly, that's exactly my motto. I live by that. <laughs> Thank you for your time and good luck in the future. Thank you very much. All right, that was it, this week's vlog, my interview with Steve Hellstrip. Steve, thank you very much for your time, much appreciated. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below and make sure to subscribe. Once again, thank you for watching and until next time, Bye-bye.